Welcome everyone to the second day of the bootcamp. Um, very happy that Costas will continue today uh, his tutorial from yesterday. So yesterday Costas uh, gave uh, uh, an intro to the uh, landscape of uh, equilibrium computation in uh, convex concave, non-convex concave games, and generally games that arise in machine learning. And then in his second part, he dive deeper into uh, situations where things are easy, meaning that things are tractable. So convex concave games and, and also correlated and coarse correlated equilibrium in general games. And today we're, uh, he's gonna cover the harder topics. So he's gonna go into non-concave games, uh, the complexity of computing equilibria and local solutions in those situations and potential ways that we can go around this intractability. Thank you again. All right, thank you very much. Uh, hi everybody, good morning. So I will uh, indeed uh, move to uh, more, more complex uh, scenarios today. And uh, just to remind you, uh, the, the, you know, the plan of this tutorial. Uh, so yesterday I covered situations where um, uh, you have a strategic setting where uh, the utility of every agent is concave in their own actions. I talked about uh, uh, learning dynamics, how to remove oscillations, and how to uh, uh, get fast convergence rates to equilibrium. Uh, today, I'm going to switch attention to uh, right. So, so, so those games are motivated by classical applications uh, of game theory. Today, I'm going to move to a different setting, motivated by more recent applications of game theory in uh, machine learning. I consider non-concave games. These are games where uh, agents' utilities are not necessarily concave in their own actions. Also, which is the same as uh, saying that their loss functions are non-convex in their own actions, right? And um, I want to understand uh, what types of uh, equilibria are guaranteed to exist in this setting and how complex it is to find them, all right? Question. The slides are there. The slides are here, yes. Okay, it's different from yesterday. Yeah. Um, good. So, in part three, I'm going to dive into what types of solution concepts exist in this setting. Um, long story short, uh, even local notions are going to be intractable. And I'll explain why that happens. And in part four, which is an, in the next hour, I'm going to uh, uh, look at how to go around the intractability barrier by uh, thinking about special game classes that are broad enough to capture interesting uh, and important applications, but uh, narrow enough that uh, uh, the intractability can be sidestepped. All right, so starting with this uh, part of the tutorial, as I was saying yesterday, many recent applications in machine learning involve uh, multi-agent learning. And uh, from a game theoretic standpoint, uh, the types of applications you see here on the board and, you know, you know, extrapolating to the future, the types of applications that I expect to see uh, uh, coming in the next uh, decade. Um, you have a multi-agent uh, problem. Uh, agents uh, are supposed to choose high dimensional uh, continuous uh, actions. Uh, and uh, what makes it a strategic scenario, not a distributed optimization scenario, is that every agent has their own utility function that they wish to optimize. Except they don't control all the inputs to that function. They control one of the inputs, and the other inputs depend on the other guys. All right, I could be, as I was saying yesterday, I might be thinking of utilities that are, we want to maximize, or losses that we want to minimize. You know, this is minus that. So. I, I think today I will be consistently using the utility uh, notation and not the loss notation, but I'm reminding uh, you of that alternative view in case that connects better to yesterday. Okay. Now, the types of applications I had on the previous board, uh, as I was saying uh, yesterday, and I repeat today, involve situations where, uh, yeah, so the Decisions are high dimensional and continuous. Uh, uh, agents may actually even impose constraints of what actions are available to others. So I will generally be represented 
representing the constraint set of the actions as calligraphic S, uh, I'm going to assume it's compact and convex. And uh, right, so they want to maximize utilities that depend on their own action and the actions of the others that are non concave in their own actions, typically, uh, which is a minus. Is a minus. Uh, the plus is that uh, typically their lips it's differentiable and smooth, at least almost everywhere. And uh, you know, another minus is that uh, these utility functions are not really known. They really are known, uh, you know, only first order information is known about them, right? I mean, you, you know, you can dive deeper and, you know, uh, you know uh, get higher order info, but it's expensive, okay? So we can think of it as, you know, we can think of it as having access to first order information. If you, you know, try harder, maybe second order and so on and so forth. I'm going to be calling these types of games smooth, non-concave, continuous games. Okay, so they're non-concave because the utilities are non-concave in one own, one's own actions. Uh, they're smooth because the utilities are at least smooth. Uh, they're continuous because the decisions are, uh, you know, continuous. Uh, and yeah, they're high, typically high dimensional as well. Uh, so just a, a remark for you know those more familiar with the game theoretic setting of normal form games, the setting that I have here is certainly rich enough to capture the standard normal form setting, right? Where you have every agent has a finite number of strategies, and they want to and they want to choose a randomization over those. So this certainly this setting certainly captures that because you can always set your action set. To be the simplex over your uh, uh, actions, the finite set of actions that you have, and uh, have a utility function that depends on everybody's randomizations, and it's just the expected uh, utility of the action profile chosen under the product measure of these uh, mixed strategies. So, certainly, okay, my setting is you know much richer than the standard setting. Uh, and it's much harder because this is a multilinear function uh, in the end, but you know, I'm talking about non-concave settings here. The other remark I want to make, uh, yeah, Yuval? Can you say a word about uh, the last uh, line there? Uh, uh, this one here? No, no, uh, what line uh, about that? The, the, one, the last line before the, uh, yeah. This one? Why is this the only access we have to? Uh, so I, I remarked that, that uh, if you, if, you know, if uh, your actions are parameters of a neural net and these are plugged into some utility and you know other people's uh, actions come into play, you, uh, you know, I said earlier that, you know, it's typically easy to get this type of info, and if you spend a lot more money, you can get higher of the information. Uh -huh. That's what, this okay. is the problem. Yeah. All right, so that's that. This remark, I hope, was you know uh, clear. And the last thing I want to remark, another trivial point, is that with non-concavity, equilibrium may not exist. Why? Because you can take games like this one. You have two agents. They're playing a zero-sum game. The utility of one player is the difference squared. The utility of the other player is minus that. And this game has no equilibrium. Why? Because, you know, uh, whatever, uh, you know, if x1 and x2 are different, uh, u2 wants to, uh, wants to tighten, wants to come close, wants to go on x1. Uh, but if uh, x2 is on x1, x1 wants to go as far as way as possible. So there's no equilibrium here. Yeah, makes sense. Cool. So this, yeah, uh, question. There's a question from... On all this, uh, on the internet, is that a promise reduction? How do we refute fake utilities or fake gradients? Uh, which reduction, uh, actually? Uh, I didn't talk about any reduction. It is a, mo it is a model of a game, right? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, you know, how, how do you re refute that potentially TensorFlow may return the wrong gradients to you? I guess you have to trust TensorFlow that it, you know TensorFlow returns the right gradients. 
So let me just make that remark and leave it at that. Right, so yeah, so you query, you know, you write down your model, everybody runs down their model, there's some utilities, neural nets come into play, and you have access to TensorFlow and they return the gradients. Okay, this is my model. About, it's uh, there's no stochasticity in place here, right? I mean, uh, uh, I that's sure. Okay, you can you can you can consider models like like Gans, for example, where um, you know the utilities involve an expectation, and really have access only to expected to 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 stochastic gradients. So that's that's. This question thought. was more like in, in all the interpretability results you present. Later, oh, later oh, on. For later, okay. Yeah. So let's save that for later. <laughs> I'm not there yet. <laughs> okay, good. So here's a here's a uh, overarching question. Uh, uh, here are some overarching questions I want to ask for these settings. Again, you know, like this setting uh, captures the classical setting for which we have uh, uh, many solution concepts, but this is a different beast. The equilibria don't exist necessarily. So the questions I want to ask is. Uh, what are the game theoretic recommendations for these kind of settings? What are meaningful solution concepts that we as uh, analysts of these games uh, want to suggest uh, are reasonable uh, operating points for these types of games? And also, if we answer that, are they practically attainable? Now, what do I mean by meaningful? At the very least, they must always exist. There shouldn't be any question about their existence because you know if our you know if we if our axiom is you know non-concave games uh, uh, should be analyzed at this type of equilibrium, then it better be that this equilibrium uh, ha, you know has has guaranteed existence. If if uh, its existence is uh, in question, then uh, uh, you know. Uh, our theory sometimes work and sometimes doesn't work, right? So Newton wouldn't be as famous if his theory partially works. Um, all right, so they should at least be universal. Uh, they should also be, I mean, if this is a model of, you know, uh, you know, of how agents uh, uh, behave in a, in a situation like that, uh, whatever solution concept we, we, we you know, we, we, we propose as an axiom of, you know, what rational behavior might be, should better be verifiable with the information that agents have about their utilities, right? So if they have first order access to their utilities, whatever we propose should be verifiable with that information, right? You shouldn't ask them to solve an empty hard problem to decide if they're happy with the situation in hand. Um, so on the practical attainable front, well, uh, you know, uh, what we'd like is, that they are efficiently reachable with uh, you know information that the agents have about their utilities as well, right, through gradient descent or some similar lightweight uh, optimization method. So these are the desiderata for uh, a solution concept. If I were to uh, postulate one, <coughs> and uh, you know axiomatize that uh, agents in a situation like that behave in this way. And uh, I have a proposal for you. <laughs> uh, uh, here it is. Um, uh, so I'm going to say that a strategy profile X star, which contains a strategy for each of my agents here, and satisfies the constraints of my problem, uh, is a first order local Nash equilibrium. If for every agent, if, I, if that agent asks themselves, you know, hey, I have first order information about my, my utility, you know, could I improve my utility by just doing a graded step? Subject to the constraints and the problem. So uh, imagine the agent says, okay, let me fix what the other guys are doing. Compute the gradient of my utility where I, 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 what, where I currently play with respect to my variables. Try to move in that direction. Okay, maybe there's some meta here if you want. From the current point, some meta in this direction. And then project back uh, to the constraints as, as those are, whatever constraints are imposed by the other people, which is this symbol here. This is the constraints for person I, given the strategies of the others. If that whole uh, mental uh, exercise brings me back to what I'm currently playing, 
I'm like, you know, with the information that I have, that's reasonable. Okay, this is my uh, proposed uh, local natural equilibrium concept. You So, sorry about asking questions. Not at all. But yes. Normally, a solution concept tries to capture uh, behavior of the players. Uh, who are the players here, and why do you assume that this, these are the kinds of moves they will try to make? Uh, so, I'm in an abstract setting, so my players are these two guys. These are my players. I would like to uh, encounter one of them <laughs> in the physical world. But, but I'm asking seriously, yeah. I mean, what, what kinds of situations yeah. um, are, are these yeah, so, neural networks playing against each other or? So uh, I don't want to. Yeah, yeah, this could be all of the above. I don't want to fix it because uh, I want to uh, propose a theory of non-concave games. But like, uh, think of it as uh, as follows, right? So imagine that you have uh, you want to build your robot that you're gonna launch in the wild, uh -huh. and um, you know that robot yeah, has a way. Like this, exactly. It looks like this, right? Uh -huh. So <laughs> so that robot has uh, some parameters that you can. Uh, uh you know and now with, with that control its operation in the world mm -hmm. now this robot is going to encounter you know other robots uh -huh. and uh you know their decisions are going to be entangled and that robot doesn't really understand the world so much doesn't really understand so but it can take gradient uh you know you can compute the gradient of its own utility of its own actions so that is the situation i'm thinking about so you're assuming there's some computer system that is running something and what it can do is to compute gradients. Yes. yes. And that's why you just did that. That's right. That's exactly right. Okay. And you know, my robot, uh, well, I guess my, my solution comes to here is like, you know, this robot is in the world interacting with other robots. And it's like, okay, let me try to improve my situation. I do a gradient steps, I do five gradient steps, 10 gradient steps, doesn't, it doesn't work. Okay, let me stay here. This is the solution concept. Okay. Yes. I have a question. How yeah. does this first order Nash equilibrium concept compared to the one in which you have you assume that there's nothing we can evolve that would change your current strategy. Oh, I'll get to that. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Okay, so save it for this slide or something. It's a great question. I'll get to it. Uh, so can you explain what's a local Nash equilibrium just in a multiplayer normal form game? Uh, in it's multiplayer normal form game, it should be the Nash equilibrium. Yeah, right. uh, okay. in, in, if it's a, if it's multilinear. My gradient information is, you know, captures everything I can do, right? In fact, like, you know, like based on the other people's actions, either it's flat, so I'm happy, or it uh, is tilted, it's a line, right? So my utility is a line. If you fix everybody else, my utility is linear in my own stuff. So if it's tilted, then I can move somewhere. If it's flat, I'm like, okay, I'm happy. So it's a Nash in the normal form setting, but it generalizes that to the no, okay, so I think so. Let me actually these two pictures maybe are clarifying the situation. So, uh, from players, uh, from player eyes viewpoint, uh, they're happy if uh, either of these two occurs. Uh, either so, this is the constraints imposed to this player by what the other guys are doing at X star. Uh, it's a subset of you know the action space of agent I. So either agent I is on the boundary of uh, the constraints, and if they were to do a gradient step, that would land them outside and project back to this point, like it's orthogonal to the boundary at this point. Or what they're playing is inside, and the gradient is zero. These are the two acceptable scenarios for these two, you know, from, from player I's uh, viewpoint. These are the local optimality conditions for player I. And, you know, this is my robot here, and it's thinking uh, XI star is the best response to what the other robots are doing. As far as the first order Taylor approximation to my utility is concerned. Okay? So this is the situation. Excuse me? You really need. Convexity of the set. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I will. Yeah. I will. I will have convexity of the set. Otherwise, yeah. if there is only one player, does the problem become 
optimization problem. Correct. Not optimization problem. Correct. Correct. So in that scenario, don't we need second order local optimization? That's why I said it's a first order local national validity. Right? Uh, uh, as you know, uh, to check if something is a local minimum, it's an empty hard problem. Because you, you know, maybe second order info isn't enough, so you have to go to third order, fourth order, and who knows where it's going to start. So I don't want to get there because you're going to lose existence, and it's, it's an empty hard problem just to check. Even if for a single agent optimization, checking if something is a local min is an empty hard problem. So I don't want to start already in a situation where the agents cannot verify anything, even if they were by themselves, right? So uh, and that's why I, I have very sorry here. But that, that's a great uh, point. Uh, good. Okay, so this is the definition of uh, local mesh. And what do we have here? So this is just a summary slide. I'm just summarizing all the info I had before. So proposition number one is this thing is guaranteed to exist as long as, as uh, I mean pointed out, the set is convex and compact. If your constraint set constraining all actions is convex and compact, then such a thing is guaranteed to exist no matter what your utilities are. Question. Is that no step size? You can have so you can define it with a step size if you want. It's not going to matter. Right? Because, you know, think of this picture. Right? If, uh, if this step, uh, started, if, you know, if a step size of one satisfies this, a step size of it will satisfy this. And similarly, that it doesn't matter. Step size is not relevant. Uh, yeah. uh, which is good because you don't know what uh, step size everybody's using. Uh, so, uh, okay, so this notion is both verifiable with information that the agent has, or you to you. Uh, uh, yeah, that's it. Yes. <laughs> so, would, would, would it be relevant if we move to approximate the notion? Let's get let's get to it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, not not really, but yeah, we'll get to it. Uh, it would be relevant, uh, maybe. Let's see. It would be relevant in this picture. Yeah, like uh, uh, you know, Yorita will will determine a little bit how much room there is. I mean, you know, if you make you know huge steps, you will be unhappy if you. But yeah. Uh, all right, so I'm coming back to your question. Uh, your question uh, about how does this compare to what I was talking about yesterday, which was uh, jiggling things and not uh, changing. So yesterday I talked about uh, uh, single agent optimization and I defined the notion of epsilon delta local maximum. So I, I was talking about minima, but now to maximize confusion, I switch to utilities, right? So. Uh, so local <laughs> a point x is a local maximum if uh, x star if you cannot jiggle x star in a ball delta around it to increase the function by more than epsilon right so if you were to move to x you wouldn't get more than this plus epsilon if you take that to the other side that's a notion of epsilon delta local maximum i was talking about yesterday i similarly defined this other concept for two player zero sum uh, games Calling a point X star, Y star, an epsilon delta local min max equilibrium if uh, the uh, X player cannot jiggle X in a ball around uh, X star to decrease his uh, utility uh, to, uh, yeah, so no, okay, so this guy's trying to minimize, to decrease the utility of the other player by more than epsilon. And similarly, Y cannot uh, jiggle, you know, Y star to increase his utility more than this. So that is what I was talking about yesterday. Let's try to generalize that for multi-agent games. So here's a multi-agent game. Constraints, people trying to maximize their own utilities, but they depend on the other people. So what is an epsilon delta? By the same token, epsilon delta local Nash equilibrium. It's a point X star such that uh, for every player, they cannot uh, jiggle their xi star to some other xi to increase their utility by more than epsilon, right? Uh, jiggle within the ball of radius delta. So this is the by the same token, right? So you know, like this 
led to this, which you know, by the same token leads to this. Now, how does this compare to the concept of uh, local Nash equilibrium I was talking about earlier? Well, they're the same. Okay, so uh, uh, you know, if you consider approximation, so uh, so so this is the approximate version of the notion I was talking about before. An agent uh, cannot will not be changing their point by more than gamma if they do a, a gradient step. This is what this says. Rather than exact equality here, it's an approximate version. Like, yeah, I could, uh, you know, I could change, but it was just to change a little bit, okay? This is what this says. So in the regime where delta here, delta here is smaller than, uh, you know, root two epsilon here, over L, the, the smoothness of the utilities involved here, uh, uh, these are two computationally equivalent, right? So in other words, if you want to compute uh, such a point, you can set your gamma appropriately, find such a point, and this will be this point. Similarly, if you're interested in a particular gamma, you can set your epsilon and delta over here, find such a point and get your approximate. So these are a computationally equivalent the problems. These are, you know, two faces of the same coin. And in particular, this implies that this thing exists in this regime because I just argued that this exists even with gamma equals zero. And because the equivalence holds in this regime, uh, these things exist as long as you are not too greedy about the radius in which you're trying to find deviations. Yes. Yeah. So uh, for any, uh, yeah, for any, exactly. So uh, if you are in this regime and you are, you're asking for an epsilon delta local Nash in this sense, there is a gamma that depends on epsilon and lambda that such that if you find uh, such a fixed point, this will automatically be uh, satisfying these constraints as well. And also the other direction. If you are interested in a particular gamma, there is a way to set epsilon and delta here so that if you find a point satisfying these constraints, this will automatically also satisfy these constraints. And so these are equivalent. Yes. Maybe I missed it. Yeah. Zero, the difference guaranteed by the problem. Very yeah. Okay. Because this function here is lifted. Right. This function is lipsis because it contains gradient, and gradient is smooth. Sorry, utilities are smooth, so the gradient is lipsis, which makes this lipsis. So the whole thing is continuous, so there is a fixed point. So that's why I called it a proposition in the area, sorry, because it's kind of obvious. <laughs> right, so, um, yeah, so it's a proposition, right? So the fact that this exists shouldn't be surprising. This, under smoothness of use, this is a continuous map, right? So this is continuous. Projection is continuous. I agree with projection. So this is a continuous map. So by birth, and, and I said this convert. So I mean, okay, right. So you have to do something though. Okay, so because the constraints are entangled, the way I've said it, so you cannot just, uh, this is not the right map. So you have to go to a different map. But uh, okay, but the idea is similar, okay? Uh, yes. So, if if the gradient is not ellipsis, right? Uh, but, but it's continuous. Yes, this exists. You see, you have existence, yes. but you don't have the equivalence, correct? Uh, you need, yes. You need the smoothness. Yes. yes. So the equivalence is because you need gra the gradient to be ellipsis to have the equivalence, right? Correct. In the small yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, ultimately uh, for the equivalence, I'm going to be using essentially Taylor. Taylor, first order, right? And uh, the error there is going to be Taylor's yes. smoothness. Okay. If I have no bonds there, then yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'm making this build, but I had a question. Uh, so if so, if I'm in uh, in a first order local Nash equilibrium, is there and I can't change my action. Is there a chance that I can change the constraints I impose on other players to improve my utility? Or do we assume that constraints um, are fixed to a certain action? Uh, by changing your action, you can influence the stuff available to other people. 
but this is not gonna uh yeah so this but you know but but that is kind of like a to look ahead kind of that scenario uh, right because you have to think about like if i if i change uh, my action now potentially i'm making my utility worse but that will constrain the other people to react to that so maybe that will become better so that is not kind of that's kind of like a to look ahead solution concept uh, which i haven't thought about it's like it, typically in game theory we think about one step ahead <laughs> but uh uh, for 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 equilibrium notions, but that's an interesting idea to pursue. Like, uh, yeah, like uh, if you're in a uh, if the constraints are uh, coupling uh, agents action in a funky way, uh, of course, what you just described wouldn't work for product constraints. But like, if it if the constraints are funky, maybe if I'm smart enough, like Eva was saying yesterday, uh, if I think about the uh, you know. Uh, a multi-step uh, kind of like optimization thing. Maybe uh, you know, with, with some patience, as I was saying yesterday, uh, I can uh, improve myself. Yeah. So this is not part of this uh, Nash equilibrium uh, concept uh, because uh, you know I'm assuming that if the agent cannot improve with one step, they're not going to be thinking, oh, you know, like that will make uh, you know Yang change his strategy, so then that will improve me. So. They don't have such a good understanding of the setting if you want to think uh, more patiently like this uh yeah all right so this is uh, the existence slide so you could be thinking of it like this or you could be thinking of it like this whatever you guys prefer yeah yeah uh what is the local equilibrium there yeah uh, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, maybe zero is a local equilibrium. I have to figure out yeah, because, like, the, that makes the gradient of one of the two like well, that makes one player happy, and the gradient of the other is zero. So, yeah, zero, zero. Yeah, the gradient version works, but the other one doesn't. Uh, there's always you can always move, x1 can always move away from x. Okay, so make uh, one of the two happy. So one is happy if they're equal. X1 equals X2. One is happy. One is maximizing. The, what is the gradient of the other? Zero. Right. The okay. gradients are both zero, but the exponent and the definition are instantly. Uh, yeah, but, it to zero. It, 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 yeah, but like, uh, if you satisfy this constraint, you're not going to be proven one of the Right, so so that, that's it. It's okay. So that's why this is important. Otherwise, you lose existence. Right. So like, if you set the radius in which you're considering deviations to be smaller than a root, the target epsilon over the smoothness of that, you know, x one minus x two squared, you will realize that if you do, if you just write things out, that that won't give you an improvement better than epsilon. Right. So even though it's an exact local equilibrium in one definition, it might not be. Even though it's an it's it's an exact local equilibrium in the first order definition, it might not be exact using the other one. Correct. I mean, because uh, because uh, the gradients are both zero for the second definition. Uh, then gamma is zero. Correct. And, yeah. Uh, that doesn't necessarily imply that. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, sure, <laughs> but is there a clue? Like, whatever, like, if you want to find such a thing, you can run this algorithm and vice versa, right? Yeah, uh, cool. Are they practically attainable? This is the next question. So, these are reasonable, uh, and they always exist. Reasonable and universal, uh, verifiable with information people have, are they practical, practically attainable? So the gap people say no, right? Because uh, you know, in that situation, you have uh, in fact a two-player zero-sum game with uh, a utility for either player that is not favor in their own actions. And uh, what they try to do is to run gradient descent ascent. Uh, I mean, the fixed points of that gradient descent ascent are the local equilibria we're talking about. 
Right, because you know my definition was really fixed points of gradient descent ascent. <laughs> so this is what I mean. You know, without maybe uh, clarity about uh, the solution concept or all the existence and so forth, the, just the mere fact that they're running these types of dynamics, they're, they're shooting for this kind of solution. And what they find is that uh, these things uh, don't work. So how do you explain that? How do we explain that? These things exist. Okay. So the way the way we find local Nash equilibria, they exist. So in principle, uh, this is you know these are the fixed points of the methods that people are running. But uh, why are they not converging or converge to garbage uh, solutions? As I was saying yesterday, uh, let me try to offer a computation, like a complexity uh, uh, explanation of that phenomenon <coughs> by setting this result with uh, a statistical like some analysis of attackies. Uh, so the result says that. Even in two player zero sum, even in two, even if you're facing, you know, a two player, not, not uh, n player, you know, non zero sum, but like even if you have a two player zero sum, a uh, smooth non concave game, like a uh, game, uh, uh, any method, any method, so not necessarily gradient descent, ascent, any method that uh, uh, accesses utilities. The value queries and gradient value queries, let alone what in GANS is stochastic access, even if you have deterministic access. Uh, it, it will need exponentially many steps to find in uh, the dimension of the problem or uh, one over gamma, uh, uh, the approximation, to compute even a gamma approximate uh, uh, equilibrium. Right. So that's an unconditional result. It doesn't depend on any complexity for the assumption. If you only access the information with first order queries, you will have to take, in general, exponentially many steps to get to a approximate local first order Nash equilibrium. Even if again is to lose your sum. So that's the claim, which you know potentially explains. A little bit the frustration in practice with games, right? You know, with, with all the asterisks, like, okay, these are not worst case problems, blah, blah, blah. But uh, uh, at least what this says is that you cannot hope to build a framework for these types of games that is using gradient descent or a variant of that and is guaranteed to converge to even local approximate notions of equilibrium. Sorry. That, that, that means that whenever we are lucky and we have something good, yeah. means that either the dimension is small or the error that we ask. Yeah, or, or like the utilities are special. The utilities are special, and uh, the problem is not. Uh, ah, we have stuff. extra structure for the utilities. Exactly. Right, right. Yeah. Maybe the definition. <laughs> maybe, but the, so, so, okay, so certainly, maybe the definition. Maybe that's not the right notion. Maybe you have to find a different one. That is meaningful and universal. So, but you know, like to me, the fact that people are getting sent the same type of things means that uh, this should pass. Yeah. Um, can you explain why this is like relevant to GANs if often we can use log box for GANs, where then like we don't even have a Lipschitz plot? So it's like a different type of curvature. Uh, again, if the utilities have special structure. Maybe the worst case results not uh, hold, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I guess let me put it this way this is an open invitation to tell me why GANs would work or, or you know, might work. You know, like, <laughs> and it's not just a, an invitation, is important, right? Because if you really are a GAN believer, it'd be nice to understand why, in other what scenarios, you know, this would work. That would help our understanding of. You know what these things do. Uh, okay, so that was about first order methods. How about second order, third order, whatever methods? Uh, okay, so under a complex theoretic assumption that the class PPD is not equal to P, uh, any method, first order, second order, or whatever. Uh, we'll have to make super polynomially many steps to find uh, a approximate local Nash equilibrium. Okay, so you choose your poison. If you don't want a 
a, a conditional result. You can it's just a, you can you can use the query lower bound here, but uh, you know under a, a complex theoretic result, even a second order uh, or higher order methods will have to take super polynomial many steps. Yeah. I will become technical now. I yes. Know uh, what do we assume as uh, the the axis of the utility? Because, for example, if the utility has logarithms, yeah. it, it, it seems that everyone here will uh, be a little bit frustrated because logarithm needs uh, or exponentials, uh, for example, would need lots of time to compute them, like in P-space. The hardness is not for the the every query. Okay. Query, sorry, so the conditional result creating the utilities takes one constant time. Like, I, I agree, but what is the it is a real number, it is a rational number. Uh, so for this result, for the conditional result, this is this the previous one is a query result, right? So for this result, you know you're given a subroutine that you, you know you can run to find the it's a circuit, it's a it's a it's a it's a uh, an arithmetic circuit. It's an arithmetic circuit or, or a Turing machine. The yeah. So for the unconditional result, yeah. how robust it is to gradient descent. So if I have any dynamics and I want to yeah. find approximate fixed points, is it so any first order? Okay. Are you changing the solution group or the algorithm? Uh, the algorithm. So any any algorithm that is first order. Any first order. Yeah. So, for example, we can put in utilities something like logarithms, FTRL stuff. Uh, I don't know what you mean, man, because it's a very low bound. So, very, it's very <laughs> just ask. Ah, yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Nothing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I can do extra gradient, right? You can yes. do extra gradient. Yeah. Okay, that's that's. Yeah. yeah. So, what when when people actually run stochastic gradient descent with hands, do they? Do they converge to something? Uh, don't ask me, but, uh, <laughs> but my understanding is they're very frustrated with the whole scenario. Yeah. So they converge to an uh, uh, equilibrium of frustration? Uh, <laughs> so my understanding is it doesn't, it does not generally converge. Like whenever, you know, like. So uh, it cycles or, or diverges or whatever. Yes, it's chaotic yeah. as far as I understand. So I mean, uh, you know. There are, let me put it this way, there are very few gun experts in the world. There are many more, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, minimizers, but uh, very few gun experts. That is the, so, so what they do is like magic, as I understand. So one last comment, yeah. I guess. So if, yeah. if you use a dynamic and it converges, it should converge to the first order local NAS, right? I mean, Perfect, you, yeah. right. So in, in your example where you, you had this figure, that one was a local NAS, right? A first order local NAS with these C yeah. points, right? Yeah. Because it converges there. So this notion, you can have like garbages in the end, right? You can end up in garbages. But even that is computational. Even that is computational. Is hard. Right. So, yeah. So now just to yeah. be serious on your vast question, though, yes. I mean, people like, uh, my understanding is that many successful GAN approaches you know, the, you know, the start with you know, like uh, they do all sorts of hacks, like uh, generating a low dimensional uh, distribution first, condition on that, get bigger, and so on and so forth. But it is an art form. It's not certainly not uh, something that you know, like uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, after a few days with deep learning, you can actually do. It needs a lot of work. So, well, it's so unpredictable. Um, so if I understand correctly, that there's really no reason to look for a solution concept that will explain uh, the actual behavior. Because the behavior doesn't convert to any uh, uh, You know, I, I mean, I think it would be nice to come up with other solution concepts together with algorithms that are guaranteed to get there. That, mm -hmm. that is what I was going to say. Like, like you know, or even frameworks, including the the statistical aspects of it, that uh, you know, you know, as I was saying, like build it up in steps from low dimensional to high dimensional, with, so that the arising problems are not as uh, intractable. Yeah. So I mean, this is like a whole open, uh, you know, this is like a whole uh, a can of uh, you know interesting stuff. But 
the back, you know, this is a backdrop if you want. Yeah. I think so. There's also like a lot of tricks that people use that seems to improve training. So there, you know, it'd be interesting to at least say why do those tricks move in the right direction. Um, uh, or yeah, I think that's one. And then also to invent new tricks that would improve in the right direction. Yeah. So the, we stated this result in kind of an awkward way. Is it PPAD hard or is there something? PPAD hard, yeah. Okay, let's just say it's the right way. Okay, so I guess you all know P containing linear programming and P containing the Charles Sanger Station group. So P part is a class in between, so defined by Christos Papa Dimitri in the 90s. And um, um, uh, uh, it was a successful class for complexity theory in the sense that it captures exactly the complexity of important problems. Like uh, it, it exactly captures in the sense that these problems are PPD complete, uh, the complexity of the problem of finding fixed points of Lipschitz continuous functions and finding uh, mixed Nash equilibria in uh, normal form games. The games that I mentioned in the very beginning where every agent has a finite number of actions and they randomize over them and the utilities are multilinear. So uh, PPAD captures exactly the complexity of these uh, problems. And what we show is that computing local Nash, even in two player zero sum, smooth non-concave games is exactly as hard as these problems. It's a PPD completeness result to answer to Grant's question uh, straightforwardly. <laughs> now, uh, okay, so I wanna give some intuition about the proof. And the question I want to ask is, why are even, okay, this is interesting, I guess, uh, a little bit of a pun here. Why are even two players too many? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, that was a geeky one. Uh, uh, okay, so, um, so I want to compare uh, something we know how to solve well, which is finding local optima in single agent optimization problems. A problem that, you know, it's tractable if you care about local optimal solutions. Uh, and a uh, problem that I claim is hard. And I want to understand, you know, like, why is it that uh, single agent non-convex minimization, aka non-concave maximization, why is it an easy problem if you care about local solutions? Well, on the other hand, even just two player zero sum non-concave games are hard. Why is it such a big difference between these two problems? Uh, to uh, make this comparison, I will consider objective improvement, objective improving uh, moves on the left hand side and uh, better response dynamics on the right hand side, which is the analog of objective improvement. So here's a picture. So here's what could happen in a uh, non convex minimization problem. Right, so you know the space in my picture is two dimensional. So the single agent controls both dimensions, and uh, here I'm, I'm tracking, you know, an objective improving uh, path that my agent will follow. What do these objective improving paths satisfy? Well, the the objective has to go down in every step. Okay, so like you see the picture, like the objective goes down, you know. This is a nice case, which goes down by one point in every step, but in any event, in an objective improving path, that's the definition of objective improving. <laughs> but the objective goes down, okay, by definition of objective improving. Okay, so moving along such a path makes progress towards a local minimum. And uh, if your objective is lower bounded, and if you insist that every step you take is at least epsilon improving, then you can even bound the number of steps of such steps you need to take before you get to an epsilon local minimum. Right? Because you, have you chip away, you chip away epsilon every step. And if you're lower bounded, you know, you, you cannot chip away too many epsilons until you hit the bottom. Okay, so in a situation like on the left hand side, objective improving steps make progress towards a solution. Let's see what happens on the right hand side. What if people 
are competing in a zero sum game and they each want to make improving improvement steps so here's what a picture what the picture may look like so here i'm imagining uh, a two player zero sum game uh, with an objective that this player wants to minimize and this player wants to maximize and i'm showing you two uh, uh, possibilities okay first of all better response paths may be cyclic so they're not paths so this is a possible uh, uh, better response path right so like you know the objective starts at three the minimizing player moves uh, to the right to decrease it then the maximizing player takes over increases back to three down to one up to three and we got into a cycle so uh, uh, better response dynamics may be cyclic they don't they're not necessarily paths uh, so this path is wrong uh, dynamics uh, and uh, uh, even if even if you have a better improving uh, uh, if you have a, even if you have a better uh, better response path that is really a path another negative feature you have is that querying the function value on this path doesn't give you any hints about how far from the end of that path you are because you can very easily have the objective the values of the objective function repeating along the, that uh, path like is the case right three to one two, three to one two three right and so so uh, uh, no information gain uh, by querying you know even if I tell you that you know like where you query it is on a path and not a cycle right you know by looking at this two you don't know if this two is here 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 you, you, you get no much info about where the uh, 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 min max equilibria are points where in one direction you cannot decrease in the other direction you cannot increase now this is intuition this is all intuition to turn it into tractability proof ideally what you'd like to do is to take such a path you want a serpentine like path uh, the space filling type of path and you know embed that path in some ambient uh, space uh, you know have the values of the objective repeat on this path in such a way that querying along this path or anywhere in the ambient uh, space does not give you any hints or much hint about where the local min max solutions are this is ideally what you'd like to do uh, but, but uh, we don't know how to do that really uh, I mean we, we know how to do it now but we didn't know how to do this construction uh, without actually first proving our PPD completeness result and then exploiting some aspect of that hardness proof to turn it into a query lower bound. So we were first able to establish the complex theoretic result and then uh, exploited a feature of that uh, hardness induction to turn it into a query lower bound. Okay, so we couldn't implement this strategy uh, at once. We, we just, you know, uh, you know, if you guys think about it, maybe you can, right? So, but uh, uh, we, we first showed the PPD complete result, exploited an aspect of the proof to turn it into an unconditional result. Uh, yeah. I'm just a little bit confused. Yeah. The game that you're playing or not, sure. Sure. Right, yeah. simultaneous. Yeah. But the Talking about it seems to me that you're like you know one plays after another. No. That, that's not the intention. That's not the intention. So this is uh, this is intending to show you the values of the utility in the space where we're playing. But it doesn't mean like it doesn't mean that we're going to actually follow this path. So it's, it's like I'm just telling you like if you are an optimizer and you're like okay, you're an optimizer, right? Forget about the place. You're an optimizer. You want to find the local minimums. You put the objective here, you see a two. Oh, you're like, oh, let me look to the left. I see a one. To the right, I see a three. So oh, isn't it reasonable to go here and see if that maybe is a local nash? But then you put it down and you're like, oh, it's a two. It doesn't work. You can improve the other player could, could improve. So it's not stable. So maybe let me put it here. Oops, uh, that doesn't work because you can go here. Okay, let me go over here. Oh, it's a two. Over here is another two, a three, a one, a two. I can make you query everywhere before you say you say anything useful. That is the point. 
just to understand, in the analogy at the end of the optimizing path, uh, what we have, what is the... It's a local hash. Th th that means that the red player, the... The red the player cannot move uh, left to right. We'll to find it. everything that it is three. Uh, uh, oh, for here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for example, like if this is a local dash, then around the three, you cannot go down this way. And uh, after oh, you cannot go up. So that would be, if, if, if that's the case, this would be a solution. Uh, but the point of this picture is to show you that with three values, I can make a query everywhere without understanding anything about the picture. That is that is what I wanted to convey. Yeah. Uh, so a question from Baigit Yan, son yeah. from Yun. Uh, is there any issue like concavity to help the picture on the right? Concavity, concavity. So if you have concavity, where does it help in the in this? If it was to play. Oh, uh, concavity is not going to help you actually. It's still hard. <laughs> what? The problem is going to, unless you put both convexity and concavity, it's not going to help you. Oh, oh, you mean like it is convex okay? <laughs> no, I thought, I thought you meant only the vertical where is okay, the other one is not okay. It's not convex okay. If it's convex okay, yeah, I maybe mean, it's convex okay, then like, uh, you know, like, uh, um, I mean, I don't know, but uh, uh, it's not like it's, it's, I mean, it's not, I mean, you still have to do an analysis kind of like the one I did yesterday to, to, to you know, to, to, to argue something, but like, roughly speaking, you know, there is a subtle point in the middle, and you know, you come at it uh, if you, you know, make the right moves with this negative momentum idea of what yesterday. You have to still have to like I cannot wave my hands easily uh, to convince you because ultimately yesterday I waved my hands twice and then I showed the proof that was that took a while to, to show but uh, yeah. Was it? Yeah. It is maybe the case that if it is commercial game that means that you do not have enough freedom to put uh, the next three to one the next uh, three right. to one. Uh, oh. Because of the structure. Oh, you mean like, uh, okay, this, this is a clear, okay, is he, if you, okay, so that is a partial answer to me. Like, suddenly, like these values cannot appear, right? Because in this vertical line, this, you cannot see this if you are concave. And similarly, this. Okay, so thank you. So that is a good intuition for this picture, but I don't have a necessarily good intuition about. You know, so I, I, I think it's fairly easy to see that uh, I mean, the worst case it would cycle and, and the average would be the settle point, right? <laughs> like if you just do gradient. Oh, uh, sure. Okay. Yeah. I mean, like any uh, analysis of an ordered learner or gradient descent that has average convergence suffices for my purposes because I'm looking at a computation problem. That's right. Uh, I don't need to last it. That is correct. One other question for yeah. the PPAD. Is yeah. it uh, for the constraint case? It is for the constraint case. So we don't, don't know how to prove it for the product constraint case. Like, like, uh, like for the hardness result, the utilities are going to be okay, smooth. Uh, the domain S uh, is going to be uh, kind of, it, it is going to have some entanglement between the two players, the minimizer and the maximizer. Uh, it's not going to be a product constraint set. So this could be some hope for the gun people because uh, gun people uh, constraint. Constraint. So you can constraint. They don't put any constraints. They just put penalties and. Yeah, do I believe it? I don't know. No, I don't think that's are either yeah. fun, like it's still like there's no, like, so. But the, is the it part of the do you future. believe that it is an open problem? I think it's, a, it's an interesting other problem. I think it's uh, still hard, even with product, but you have to do more work. Um, they already a lot of work that we did. <laughs> do you believe that the unconstrained would still be hard if you put like a lot of strongly convex penalties like, that would mimic constraint? Uh, the unconstrained problem? Uh, I, I would let me say that with constraints, with uh, product constraints, I think it's still hard. 
Now you have to tell me what exactly, like what <laughs> you want it to have completely unconstrained with penalty terms if you go far away. To, to, to yeah, the typical is that you have unconstrained and you just put a melt penalty on your weights. That's a typical way to train. Uh, that arises uh, from the gun. You don't you hardly ever project uh, when you do gun training. <laughs> Let me, I mean, my guess is still hard, but uh, okay. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's a different case that it relies on the suspension. Our current perception does. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, again, I think uh, it can, yeah, it is through the product of strength, possibly also to keep it. Penal, like L2 penalties and stuff. That's an interesting question for the semester. Okay. Uh, okay, so what I wanted to do is to show you actually dive a bit deeper in the proof, but let's do it later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you.